elongating border. This is a on the record public hearing of the National Alliance Team of the United States Environmental Protection Agency regarding the Alberton Rail incident. Can you hear me? No. Just go right close to your arm. Can you hear me now? Yes. Can everyone hear me now? All right. Thank you. I'll start again. Good morning. This is a on the record public hearing of the National Ombudsman of the United States Environmental Protection Agency regarding the Alberton derailment incident which occurred in April of 1996 in Alberton, Montana. I thank you all for being here. I recognize not only is it a Saturday, it is also a national holiday. It's Veterans Day. And, um, before we commence with uh, the proceedings of the hearing and introduction of uh, the folks that are present, I would like to uh, just observe a minute of silence for veterans. Thank you for joining me in the observance. Okay, as we start the hearing, I would um, like to introduce uh, to my left Representative Sylvia Bookout Reinecke with the Montana State Legislature, and to my right, Senator Jim Elliott with the Montana State Senate, and would we'll turn to them at this time for any opening remarks they wish to make. Thank you. I'm very happy to be here, and I'm very happy to see all of you. Um, I wish there were more people from the Alberton area. I know how hard it is to get up again early on a Saturday morning and drive all the way in here. Um, the fact that more people are not here does not take away from the seriousness of this situation. We need to find out all the facts and get to closure. I think the reason many people are not here is because they have a sense of helplessness. Nothing has come out. We have so many unanswered questions. So um, that's my gut feeling of why they're not here. But they're in our hearts. We're thinking of them. Thank you, Representative Bookout. Now for opening remarks to Senator Allen. Thank you, Mr. Martin. I just uh, want to briefly introduce myself. My name is, of course, Jim Elliott. I'm your newly elected state senator for Alberton. I am a former four-term state representative from the Sanders County area. Well, I'm happy to see you here. I'm sorry that you have to be here because of the, the circumstances that you are here. But uh, I have come to listen. Thank you, Senator Elliott. Okay, I'd like to go over how we're going to proceed today um, with this congressman hearing on the record. And um, initially, I would uh, like to note that uh, several citizens from the Alberton community asked me to undertake this uh, as an ombudsman case and to do an investigation. I accepted that request. I also have uh, a request, which was made by Senator 
uh, Bacchus of Montana. And um, that was made last year. Could you speak up, please? We can't hear the back. Mm -hmm. That was made last year. And um, for purposes of the, uh, of the hearing record, um, I'll be narrating from uh, the more recent uh, correspondence I received from Senator Bacchus. Uh, with respect to the Alberton case. It reads as follows, as dated May 25, 2000. From Senator Baucus to, uh, to me as National Ombudsman. In March of last year, I wrote to request your help in obtaining more complete information on the nature of the material released in the 1996 train derailment and mixed chemical spill in Alberton, Montana. I am writing now to express both my sincere appreciation for what you have done on behalf of the victims of the spill and my firm belief that your continued involvement is essential to helping this community heal. As you are aware, many of the people exposed to the chemicals released from the spill report continuing and serious health problems, due in large part to the fact that certain measures taken in response to the spill were based on incomplete information some of those efforts were misdirected and in some instances counterproductive. But I believe we are in a position to turn that around. In that regard, I encourage you to hold an ombudsman hearing in Missoula and to help arrange for further sampling, both outdoors and inside residences, schools, and other potentially contaminated buildings. This sampling should help clarify whether or not contamination remains at these sites and should provide residents and businesses greater certainty as they attempt to move beyond this unfortunate incident. I am told that EPA's environmental response team in New Jersey comes highly recommended to conduct the sampling and therefore urge that arrangements be made for them to do the job. In view of the community's dissatisfaction with past sampling, it would be advisable for ERT to discuss a protocol with you and the community before going forward. Both the hearing and the sampling should occur as soon as possible. The rest is thank you for your help, Senator Max Baucus of Montana. Now, I want to note that many parties to uh, this case were invited to be present at this hearing today. Um, several parties are obviously not present at this hearing. The uh, Parties which could not attend, I will narrate for the record and indicate uh, their uh, uh, pledge to cooperate with the Ombudsman investigation of Alberton. The Federal Railway Association, represented by Mr. Claremont, Mr. Holgard, here in Montana, could not be present today. But in a letter which they forwarded to me this past week, they indicated they will be providing me all of their reports with respect to the Alberton derailment, and they pledge their cooperation with my investigation. Also, the um, Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry, uh, the National Ombudsman for that agency, has pledged to work with me in this investigation out of Atlanta, Georgia. I don't believe they're present either today. Uh, I also received word on uh, uh, Thursday night from uh, counsel for Montana Rail Link that the company uh, would not be present and would not be presenting today. And uh, that letter uh, also forwarded letters from the uh, Montana Department of Environmental Quality and the Missoula City County Health Department that they also would not be present today to make uh, testimony in this hearing. Uh, the uh, Montana DEQ and the Missoula City County Health Department indicated that uh, they could not be present because one person was out of the country and uh, I think it's DEQ, no, I think it's the City Health Department which indicated that the notice was simply too short to be present today. Um, Montana Rail Link, in their correspondence to me, uh, went on to opine that uh, comment, that they felt I had no jurisdiction essentially to do the case and did not recognize my authority to do the case. Um, I can tell you that that argument has been made in other ombudsman cases in other parts of the United States. Um, 
by various entities, uh, whether it's a company in the Times Beach, Missouri case, a company in Ohio in the case, which I just finished at the request of the White House, and um, also in another circumstance in Idaho where the Department of Justice even had uh, concerns about my going forward uh, with an Ombudsman case. And I will note for the record that in each and every instance, um, the authority of the Ombudsman function uh, was recognized and uh, every case has gone forward. Um, I have full faith and confidence that this case will go forward as well and that I will do my job and I will do it thoroughly. And I'm honored to do that job here in your community. Um, I invite, uh, however, legal briefs on that issue uh, if the, some of the parties feel strongly that there is no authority or jurisdiction to go forward. And I would invite those to be submitted within 30 days of the close of this hearing. Now, I do want to recognize the folks that are here. There are many folks here who are uh, residents, or perhaps former residents of the Alberton community, and also some of their technical advisors. I also understand we have representatives from Sage Environmental, which has been uh, asked to do further sampling in the community and from Olympus Environmental, which did uh, much of the work at the uh, Alberton derailment site uh, following the incident. Uh, I also understand we have a representative from the Frenchtown Fire Department. Uh, at this juncture, I would also like to note that um, EPA Region 8 um, asked me three days ago uh, to cancel the hearing. Um, I declined to cancel the hearing. Um, they indicated that they were going to have trouble uh, getting their travel together uh, to be here. And they also indicated that um, they had many experts, both within this country and internationally, who worked on the Alberton incident that could not be here. Um, I just want to assure everyone here that um, I will be working with EPA Region 8 in the course of this investigation. Uh, even though they asked to have the hearing canceled, they indicated that uh, they would try and send uh, Mr. Weiss with our Risk Assessment Division and Mr. Wei, uh, who was our, one of our on-scene coordinators during the incident, to be present this morning. Uh, my staff tells me that as of last night, um, they could not leave Denver uh, because of weather reasons. Um, I can't confirm that for you. I can only tell you that I don't see them here this morning. Uh, nonetheless, this investigation will go forward, and I am confident that we will work with all the relevant parties. And uh, the nature of this process is that after I've done that and gone through a period of deliberation, I make recommendations to the Environmental Protection Agency, which are also made available to all the parties, to all the people. It's an open process. There are no closed doors. And they are not binding. The EPA does not have to do what I ask. But in many cases, they do what I ask, in about 80% of those cases. And uh, recently, the Vice President uh, fully endorsed recommendations I made on a case in Ohio uh, two weeks ago. So the function uh, does have a significant amount of precedent, and uh, its recommendations carry some weight. I'd like to note also, before we proceed much further, that uh, Representative Gail uh, Bucci is present from House District Number 66 with the State Legislature. If she's present in the room, could she indicate? Thank you. Glad to have you here. Um, this being said, I'd like to um, take care of some other business uh, just for a few moments before we proceed to have testimony on the Alberton case. Um, I recently held uh, a hearing in Idaho about two weeks ago with Senator Mike Prepo and uh, Representative uh, Helen Chenoweth Page on another case which I've been asked to do by the Idaho delegation. And I'd like to call Mr. Robert Hopper at this time. 
who will um, present the official transcript of that hearing. It's just a bit of housekeeping business uh, for the Ombudsman Office as we proceed. Uh, welcome. Thank you. Um, the Ombudsman case for Idaho was initiated this summer at the request of both senators and both House members. And um, uh, very shortly after this hearing, I'll be going on to Spokane to hold a hearing on the Coeur d'Alene Basin case and the Silver Valley case, which will be uh, also attended by Senator Gordon of Washington, Senator Murray of Washington, and representatives from the Governor's Office of Washington. Uh, the Mayor of Spokane will also attend, as will the Chairman of the Spokane Tribe. Um, Bob, you have the transcript? Yes, I do. You can please submit that for the record. So. Yes, I will. This is the complete record of the hearing that was held on March or on October 24th, or just a couple of weeks ago, in your office in Colorado. That uh, transcript will be accepted as uh, Exhibit A for purposes of this hearing, so that we can go forward. Bob, I thank you for coming over from Idaho this morning to deliver that. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to note that uh, the Ombudsman Office co-chaired that hearing with the House Energy and Commerce Committee of the United States House of Representatives uh, two or three weeks ago. And Bob, it's been a pleasure to work with you in that case in your capacity as president of the Bunker Hill Mine. Thank you. And is there anything you'd like to say? Uh, yes. Excuse me, Michael. Yes, that better. <clears throat> yes, there is. And especially uh, listening to your opening remarks, the concept that the Ombudsman Office and the Ombudsman personally uh, not having recognized authority, that uh, this concept that is being pushed throughout the nation, and I say throughout the nation because in the last few months I've become aware of more and more that uh, we're his office is being challenged, and I've said so publicly. But those of you that are in this room, this, as far as I'm concerned, is the one honest breath of fresh air that we all have, and that's to be here in the presence of the Ombudsman today. I can think of nothing that would be of greater benefit than to be here, whatever the case, whatever the problem. The idea that you're going to have somebody that looks honestly and fairly at all issues and makes a decision only when all the facts are in, but when the facts are in, we'll make that decision and we'll stick with it. And I thank you for the opportunity to be here. Thank you, Mr. Hopkins. Now, as we proceed, um, I'll be calling uh, several witnesses this morning. Um, they'll range from uh, Mr. Waldron, who's with the uh, French Town Fire Department, um, and also to several citizens from the Alberton community that I would like to hear from and get first-hand testimony on the record in connection with the Alberton derailment in 1996. Um, following those uh, submissions of testimony, um, we will do a brief public comment period before taking a lunch break and then come back and hear from more folks on the record. So at this time, I'd like to call uh, Mr. Waldron. He's present. Good to see you, sir. <coughs> I guess since I'm the only public official here, I'm ready. I'm ready. Um, Bring the microphone. Okay, how's that? Is that better? Never mind. Never mind. Okay, hey, look, before we go on much further, we'll see if we can fix that, okay? Because I don't know if that's making it here. Robert, there's not enough gain on this system, so you just have to talk very loud. If he cranks it up there, you get that feedback. It just doesn't have that power. Statement, or you ask me to come, or uh, what, do you have questions? Or? Well, I've asked you to come. I've asked you to feel free to make any remarks you would like. I may have questions. Okay. 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 Okay.
as uh, Senator Elliott and Representative uh, Bookout can also have questions. Please feel free to proceed and say what you wish. Uh, I don't really have any major comments to make. I guess my only uh, comments that I would make are concerning uh, the fact that as the initial incident commander and as part of the unified command team, uh, all of the decisions that we made were made based on the information that we were able to gather at the time of the incident. Uh, there have been a number of insinuations that uh, some conspiracy occurred to withhold information from the public. That is not the case. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, all information was uh, disseminated to the public as rapidly as it was made available to us. Uh, at no time was there any effort on our part to keep uh, the EPA or uh, representatives of any entity uh, away from the derailment site. Uh, uh, the first uh, initial on-scene coordinator, and I can't remember his name, I uh, did restrict from the site primarily because... Well, Mr. Mr. Waldron, I think what would be helpful for me, uh, what you're saying is valuable, uh, would be to first indicate um, what your responsibilities are with Frenchtown. Okay. And then secondly, indicate, um, in your view, uh, what events transpired around the realm. Uh, I don't know that I have that many days, but I was the fire chief of the Frenchtown Fire District. I was the initial incident commander of the derailment and uh, ultimately by uh, the grace of two county commissioners of Mineral Missoula County was identified as the lead incident commander of the Unified Command Team that managed the incident. That team included myself, uh, Dan Watts from Montana Rail Link, Dallin Leahy from the Missoula County Health Department, uh, Dave Ball from uh, Missoula County Sheriff's Office, and Steve Way of the Environmental Protection Agency. Our role was to work to uh, mitigate the incident with the use of all resources available to us, both government and private. And that's what we did. And can you describe at all um, how the derailment transpired and your involvement? Well, we responded about 4.30 in the morning on April 11th. It was raining lightly. Uh, it became very apparent early on. We knew that it was a chlorine derailment. Uh, made the decision to evacuate people uh, and personnel from the two county agencies and uh, fire departments from Alberton and Frenchtown conducted that uh, evacuation. Uh, we evacuated to an area that uh, and created an exclusion zone that uh, was approximately uh, Oh, geez, it's been five years. Uh, five miles long, something to that effect, for the first couple of days. We shrunk the hot zone after that to a small area as we gained additional information. That we were able to do so. We worked closely with uh, private contractors and EPA and Coast Guard and any number of agencies to uh, mitigate that incident, which took 17 days. Is it true that there were two zones? after the accident occurred, was there a hot zone and an exclusion zone? Uh, there was an area that we classified as a hot zone where it was around the rail cars. Uh, it was actually the work site area. We also maintained roadblocks. Primarily, uh, roadblocks were maintained uh, in the event uh, an, an additional release, release incurred, occurred. And also, just the situation on traffic. We had, we had to close traffic at St. Regis on the west and uh, Missoula on the east. <coughs> and uh, can you tell me, for the record, who, who worked in the, uh, in the hot zone at the site? Uh, private contractors, uh, representatives of the Coast Guard, uh, EPA, uh, representatives of the Missoula Regional Hazardous Materials Team, I think they were all present and, and, uh, and uh, you know, some technical experts that were brought in to try and help mitigate it. Um, can you identify for the record uh, which private contractors, to the best of your knowledge, worked in the hot zone? No, I can't remember. That's all public documentation. But it is your recollection that the 
the United States Coast Guard and the United States Environmental Protection Agency did work in the hot zone. Yes. Do you have any other remarks? Or? No, I guess just to carry on with my statement was that, that we uh, did disseminate information, uh, worked closely with all entities, uh, uh, tried to provide everything that we knew and did provide everything we knew to the public as uh, quickly and as rapidly as it was capable, uh, conducted and approved testing that uh, seemed appropriate. and. Uh, and as a side note, I was supposed to pick Steve Way up at the airport at 8 o'clock this morning. I spoke with him last night. They, they had, because of the late notice of this meeting, they had to get a charter plane. And uh, the charter plane was, uh, the pilot was unwilling to take off this morning. Uh, he called me this morning and said he wouldn't be here. So they did make an attempt to come. Well, thank you for letting me know that. Um, I have a couple additional questions, and then Representative uh, Book out my idea. She has one as well. Um, what kinds of information were you provided uh, about the contents of the, the train cars and, and who provided that information at the time of the incident? Uh, initially, the first morning, I was personally handed the uh, way bills uh, within just a few minutes of the derailment. I don't recall if they came from the engineer or from one of my personnel as they were transporting the engineer to the hospital, but they came from our ambulance personnel who were transporting the engineer on the rail car. Uh, I personally had those, and I passed those directly on to the uh, hazardous materials representatives so that they could evaluate uh, what issues we had to deal with. And what uh, sorts or kinds of information did those bills give or provide? Uh, there are standard way bills that show weight and location of cars, and. Uh, contents of the car, car numbers, that type of information. In your capacity, uh, were you ever involved in the decisions uh, about re-entry uh, to the exclusion zone? Uh, the re-entry criteria uh, was developed with the health department, uh, University of Montana. Uh, I don't recall all who participated in that, but it's part of the unified Man team, I certainly as a group of approved them. And to the best of your knowledge, um, who uh, controlled uh, decisions about entry uh, into the hot zone during the time of the incident? Uh, the unified command team made those decisions on who was allowed in or out. We developed that primarily after trying to determine who needed to be there. Uh, you need to understand that we were inundated by dozens of federal and state agencies and trying to uh, determine who could safely operate in there was the criteria that we currently use. Mm -hmm. So that was a team decision as opposed to any one party making that decision? Uh, that's correct. The, the only uh, caveat to that would be probably in the first day those were probably my decisions. And the decision that we initially made or I initially made was once we got people out, we just needed to take some time to figure out what we had, make some decisions, we sent some help qualified personnel in to evaluate the scene. Uh, we restricted everybody until we had appropriate personnel to safely operate. Mm -hmm. So it's your testimony that any such decision was made after the first day by the team, and that on the first day you would make those calls? That's pretty much correct. I, I don't exactly recall at this time when the unified command was totally complete, it may have been a couple of days, but we tried to include the appropriate people in that unified command and uh, to uh, make those decisions. Mm -hmm. But in no event did um, Montana Rail Link make those decisions unilaterally? No. Um, what data uh, did you rely upon for the decision to, uh, what did the team rely upon for the decision to allow people back into the exclusion zone? after the incident? Uh, again, I think that's uh, public record. I don't recall that, and that was primarily based on doctors, and uh, I think, like I say, University of Montana Health Department, I'm not a uh, health expert. We, we relied on their expertise. Mm -hmm. So, uh, in, in your judgment about the safety of going back in, all that information is reflected in the public record? Uh, I believe so, yes. 
Uh, I have no further questions at this time. I do want to thank you for appearing, and uh, I'd like to note that your appearance is entirely voluntary. I have no subpoena power whatsoever, and uh, I'm grateful for your cooperation. Representative the book out. Um, my question was answered. You asked it. Okay. Three and three. Senator Rowley? Aye. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to call at this time um, Mr. Garen Smith, if he's present. Thank you for being here, sir. Thank you. I, I have to leave early, so I appreciate you putting me on the agenda uh, early. Uh, I just wanted to volunteer to come down and uh, answer questions, if there were any, from uh, your office or the other public officials here regarding the Albertan spill. I was not present uh, in the area when the original accident occurred. I was uh, on spring break on the Oregon coast and only found out when I tried to get back to Missoula that I was going to have to do a detour at St. Regis because of the incident. Uh, I got home and, and read the papers. Uh, I'm a, an environmental chemist. I also serve on the Board of Health for Missoula County which includes their Air Pollution Control Board and Water Quality District. So anything that impacts public health, I'm fairly interested in. Uh, I officially became uh, involved in the incident when Jim Carlson, who's the Director of Environmental Health Affairs for the uh, uh, Health Department, called me and said, people have been complaining about pesticide-like odor out of the site. Uh, here's what's, what's out there. Do you see anything that would cause concern? Uh, I have provided a narrative report as part of the public record. Brought a copy of that, and we didn't have that available, which describes the scenario. Essentially, uh, I, I listened to what he said, talked to a couple of my colleagues, and we thought unless there was was just immediate contact between the tanker that had the potassium crystalline and the chlorine, that there wasn't much of a chance that that just ambient levels would cause a problem. As events unfolded, I learned that the potassium crystalline tank and the chlorine tank were in direct contact, at which point I said, well, that's a scenario that, that I don't feel comfortable with. If you give me some samples, I could run them on my instrumentation and probably give you a quick answer as to whether some cross products formed. That was done. The sample was brought to me on the evening of Wednesday, April 17th. Uh, one of my graduate students, a technician at the time, thought we had gotten the soil sample from the site. Uh, we've We've got an instrument that's set up to do an analysis of hazardous air pollutants of certain categories by baking them off in a process called thermal desorption. We took the sample, we thermally desorbed it into our instrument. It turned out that it was concentrated sludge from, from the immediate site, so what it did was quickly coated the inside of my instrument with this material, which meant I had to uh, take it apart and rebuild it after this one sample. Uh, but from that one sample, it was easy to see that we had chlorinated organics that were of the type I would expect as a combination from the tanker contents uh, being subjected to chlorine gas. Uh, I've included a copy of that initial sample, plus some documentation identifying the sorts of compounds that I found in that initial sample. This was a qualitative experiment just to see what sorts of compounds were present. It wasn't a quantitative run that would have taken uh, more time to set up standards of, of this sort. Uh, very soon after I did my initial survey and indicated that there were chlorinated products present, um, the services of Contract Environmental Lab were made available and they started to conduct the sampling after my initial round. I was part of the team that helped develop the criteria for re-entry into the Alberton area after I became involved and had gotten that analysis done. From my chronology, it shows that uh, I worked with a team on Friday of that week, which would have been April 19th. Uh, and mostly my input was uh, regarding the chlorinated organics. Uh, from uh, subsequent material that has come in in the way of analyses, soil samples from the contract lab, it looks to me like the organics did not uh, disperse very uh, far from the, the actual site. Most of these are fairly heavy compounds. They tend to absorb to the uh, organic matter in the soil uh, rather than, than 
become airborne or even waterborne, although they can leach out of the soil into uh, water at low levels. So I think I'll stop there and, and see if there are any questions. Again, I'd like to thank you for appearing and like to note for the record that the uh, documents you speak of will be accepted for the record as Exhibit B. Thank you. It still has all of the spell, spelling errors and grammatical errors. I, I gave it to you exactly as it was submitted at the time. Thank you. Um, could you describe, uh, to the best of your ability, the uh, physical properties of the chemicals found in the area of the derailment? Um, one, in terms of solubility, and two, in terms of volatility? The uh, compounds that I noted that were uh, in the samples that I analyzed were, first of all, the parent material in the tanker itself. That was uh, potassium chrysolate. That's a, a potassium salt of an organic compound called cresol. At lower pHs, cresol is a, uh, a liquid. At higher pHs, it has an ionic charge and uh, takes a, a cation like potassium uh, to match its charge in solution. As a solution at high pH, it, it's uh, uh, an ionic uh, material and it doesn't volatilize at all. Uh, so I saw uh, phenol, which is used in the production of cresol. I saw cresol itself, which has three different forms, uh, very strongly in the, in the signature. As that material moved from the tanker, which was a very high pH or basic condition, onto the soil, if the conditions become lower than pH 10, then those organic solvents can volatilize. Uh, uh, phenol is, is uh, uh, a solid at room temperature. It becomes a liquid at slightly above room temperature, although if it's in a dissolved mixture, it can volatilize a little bit. The cresol uh, is a liquid at room temperature. It does volatilize and has a very medicine-y sort of odor to it, um, a medication called ambisol that's used for uh, taking care of tooth toothaches has that same sort of smell to it. Also in the tanker contents were a number of uh, chemical species that had sulfur in them. These would be called mercaptans or thiols or thioethers. Uh, my understanding is that the potassium chrysolite tanker was used to help remove sulfur compounds from petroleum products, probably through a process of sparging. Those materials are very uh, odiferous. Uh, and they also uh, poison catalysts, so they, they try to remove them. Our noses are very sensitive to sulfur compounds. We can, we can detect many of those at uh, below the parts per billion range, so I think probably some of those sulfur compounds, which would be volatile, could contribute to an odor sensation. I also found uh, a number of chlorinated phenolics and chlorinated uh, cresol uh, materials. Uh, these would be in a category of compounds that's sometimes referred to as AOX by the pulp and paper industry because they are also byproducts of pulp bleaching. They do dissolve in water, uh, although their solubilities uh, wouldn't be described as, as high. They can dissolve into to water and be uh, detected in, in samples. Uh, their volatility is uh, in the category of what I would call semi-volatile. They do. They do vaporize, but they, they don't uh, vaporize as easily as, as something like uh, the contents of, of gasoline would. Because they have the oxygen in their structure, uh, they have uh, hydrogen bonding or, or stronger dipole-dipole interactions, which reduces their vapor pressures. Um, in your professional judgment, is it possible that uh, other chemicals went airborne in the initial plume or cloud from the uh, derailment area, uh, such as chlorine uh, chrysolite reactants and or uh, any other components of potassium chrysolite? Yeah, I, I, this, this is going to purely be uh, conjectural. Uh, I, I presume that, that the ruptured chlorine tanker um, was uh, venting the chlorine gas at a fairly high rate so I would expect uh, gaseous elemental chlorine to be present, which is a very uh, active oxidizing agent, will react with most organic materials almost immediately. So that was always my, um, my highest priority health concern was the gas phase level chlorine. Uh, 
Um, as, it, as the tanker evacuated, that rapid expansion causes a cooling process, so I would expect that water vapor in the area was condensed into an aerosol mist of, of fine fog-like droplets. So I think there was probably an aerosol mist that was produced by the rapid decompression of the chlorine leaving the tanker. Once that aerosol mist of, of water droplet, droplets forms, then various materials can partition into those droplets and move with them. Among the candidates that I would think most strongly would get into that aerosol mist would be any hydrochloric acid that was produced by chlorine reacting with materials in the area. Hydrochloric acid rapidly will partition into a, an aqueous medium. Uh, there's a famous chem chemistry demonstration called an HCl fountain where one drop of water will completely uh, consume all of the hydrogen chloride in a, a flask, makes a vacuum, and you can have it pull water up in a, a fountain-like spray. So any HCl in the area, I think, would have, would have partitioned into this initial mist so that that uh, aerosol would be quite acidic. The potassium uh, chrysolate uh, materials uh, are soluble under basic conditions. Um, they have a negative charge. Uh, when you put them in an acidic solution, the hydrogen replaces the potassium. They become an uncharged molecule. So if hydrochloric acid did partition into the mist, that would actually make it less likely to, to have uh, the potassium chrysolate materials dissolve into it. Uh, again, in your capacity as a professional chemist, uh, and realizing that some speculation may be involved, uh, if you were to test for the presence of a chlorine gas exposure, what would you test for? Uh, I'm, I'm not really uh, experienced at all in, in looking at exposures uh, to humans and or, or organisms. My specialty usually relies in, in taking air samples uh, and water samples and telling uh, the uh, person who's interested what, what was in the air and the water that might be received by a person. Once those materials are actually intercepted and ingested or, or breathed in by, by an organism, I really don't have expertise in toxicology at all. I'm mostly a, a fate and transport type person. With so the I'm understanding that it's not your particular field of expertise. And what, what I would look for uh, with the, uh, the chlorine exposure is, uh, since the, the chlorine uh, is, is very reactive, uh, if it made any bleach solutions, that's also uh, very reactive. I think the mucous membranes would uh, uh, be targeted by hydrochloric acid, by bleach, by chlorine gas, and show signs of, of irritation. Um, if there were uh, uh, enough of the bleach byproducts present, uh, when that comes into contact with skin, it makes compounds called chloramine. So if you've ever smelled your fingers after using bleach, there's that sort of uh, odor that, that's residual that you can smell on your fingers even after you wash, wash your hands. Uh, I might look for, for some evidence of chloramine uh, formation on uh, external skin surfaces. I did notice when I was out at the site um, after the area had been completely opened again, some bleached flat patches in an alfalfa field across from, from the uh, spill site. So I know some plants there uh, became chlorotic due to their exposure. I saw uh, a greenish film on copper fixtures, doorknobs and hinges. Uh, I saw corrosion on um, uh, metal stacks from, from uh, wood burning stoves. So I know that there was chlorine exposure in those areas. It didn't really work at all with the medical aspects of the, the people who were exposed. Um, again, in your capacity as a chemist, would, would you expect hydrogen chloride formation as a result of a, of a chlorine gas release? I would, I would expect <coughs> hydrochloric acid to, to be uh, formed in uh, the as, as a uh, result of <coughs> chlorine acting as an oxidizing agent. Uh, chlorine gas uh, in its elemental form has an oxidation state of zero. Uh, its most stable form, because it gets an octet of electrons, is, is has a minus ion. So as it, as it gets reduced from a zero state to a minus one state, um, it's, it's going to oxidize something else. 
So uh, I, would, I would presume that there would be uh, a lot of uh, chlorine uh, in the area. Uh, I do know that, that uh, uh, I've, I've read that, that chlorine will react with water vapor to produce HCl and hydro, uh, hydrochloric, hypochloric acid. So uh, I, was, I was going on that basis. Mm -hmm. Would that, in your opinion, um, necessarily uh, result in pH changes in the ground? Uh, the, the hydrochloric acid would <coughs> change the pH of any surface waters that weren't buffered. Uh, I don't know what the lime content of the, the waters are in, in that area. Uh, I, I did ask rain research for uh, a number of years back in New York, and if I captured actual droplets of rain on leaf surfaces, I could see the, the pH there. As soon as it went into the soil, the, uh, the buffering, natural buffering in the soil from uh, carbonate uh, rock contents immediately neutralized that back to a, a pH range of about 7. Uh, if, if there were waters that were not uh, in contact with, with soil components, I could see it causing uh, some pH change if, if the carbonate levels weren't there. I think the carbonate level in the Clark Fork River, this is just pulling stuff out of the, off the top of my head, is about 3 times 10 to the minus 4th molar. Given that concentration, um, I wouldn't expect the HCL probably made a measurable difference in, in waters. Um, can you say for certain that uh, dioxins were not present in the potassium crassolate solution originally? No, this was part of a number of questions that were asked uh, initially. Uh, I did look at the products that were formed and noted that in one instance, the locations of the chlorines that, that were added to the um, cresolate and, and phenylate compounds were in a position such that if they dimerized, they could lead to a 2378 substitution pattern, which is the one that's used on dioxin to um, score its uh, toxic impact from. So any, any compounds that are chlorinated dibenzo dioxins or Difurans uh, are dibenzone uh, furans are given a, a toxic um, score. Uh, so I did see one compound that could have potentially dimerized into a dioxin or a furan that could have that substitution pattern. Um, I asked a, an expert who happened to be interviewing in our department at the time, uh, who's a bleach chemist for uh, the pulp and paper industry what his opinion was on that dimerization reaction. And he said from, from his uh, perspective that it was more likely that there were dibenzodioxins or dibenzofurans already existing in the potassium crescent tanker, and that if those were there, then they could have been chlorinated during the accident. He thought that was a more likely scenario to their origin than actual dimerization after the initial chlorination products had been formed. Are you familiar at all with the uh, white dust which was observed at the site? There was a lot of talk about the white dust. I never went out actually into the, the closed zone, um, partly because my beard doesn't usually allow a respirator to get a good seal. Uh, so we, we talked as a team about what that white powder might have been. A lot of the residents were talking about this white residue. There was talk that it might have been uh, some residual lime, because a lot of lime had been spread around the, the accident site, and that may have been blowing around. That was the basis for our testing for a, uh, a carbonate test, because the lime would have, would have been uh, something that effervesced if you put an acid on it. We talked about uh, KCL uh, potentially uh, having been formed, uh, so we did white testing of the white dust uh, to get a solution so that I could test for the presence of chloride ion, although Chloride ion is pretty ubiquitous. Uh, I just thought if somebody could get a concentrated sample of the white dust, we could check it. I've actually used that sort of a test um, in a, a previous incident involving some janitors having a white film build up in one of their storage closets, and that test worked great to, to indicate what that white powder was. So we did 
design uh, a series of tests to see if it was potentially any of the lime material that was spread at the accident site, or if it might have been some KCL that would have been a byproduct of the potassium crystalline basic solutions interacting with, with the chlorine. Uh, to the best of your knowledge, was the white dust ever analyzed for organics? Not that I can remember. I think we did some hexane uh, wipes to pick up samples to see uh, if there were organics. Hexane would be a, a solvent that would, would help uh, soluble <coughs> organics. At the moment, right off the top of my head, I don't remember ever seeing any, any uh, reports from that. I do remember conversations with the uh, people who were doing the sampling saying they were having trouble finding examples of this white dust. They couldn't find anything that they could scrape off and bring to me. If, if I would have had a um, uh, sample of, of the white material actually in the lab, I could have done any number of things to, to try to discern what its chemical composition was, but they were never able to scrape together enough of, of a material that they could hand me a little finite amount of powder and say, this is the white stuff, but we want to know what it is. So in view of that practical problem, it's difficult to determine the precise composition of the white dust. That's, that's correct. Um, in your opinion, is there any kind of uh, human health sampling, such as tissue, uh, blood, or fat biopsy that could have been done to assess uh, more broadly contaminants of concern? And that's, that's wandering a little bit out of my, my area of expertise. Look, looking at the chemistry of, of these materials, um, the types of, of materials that I would be most worried about, uh, I think, would partition into fatty tissues, uh, preferentially more than, than any other uh, sort of uh, tissue in, in inside an organism. <coughs> so if I were going to go looking for them, I would, I would look at, at uh, some analysis of of fatty tissues to see if there was evidence of, of chlorinated organics there. Doctor, could you, uh, for my information, uh, tell me the ambient air temperature at the uh, time of the wreck? And not at the time of the wreck, but in, in general, I suppose, and uh, what role that may have played in the dissemination of gas, and what that may have been had that temperature been different. Yeah, I, I, I was not ever at the, the site. In, in retrospect, I've looked at um, reports that, that talked about the weather conditions. Um, I think that, uh, as I said earlier, there was probably local cooling taking place from the, the chlorine expanding out of the, the tanker so that um, I think the uh, actual mixing zone between those chemicals was probably um, being cooled off. Uh, I, I recall, I, I don't remember actual temperatures, I recall hearing people talk about the fact that there was a temperature inversion uh, during parts of the, the incident so that uh, during a temperature inversion, materials are usually confined closer to the ground and not able to, to lift vertically and disseminate out of the area. There was some concern about uh, that inversion situation uh, leading to higher exposures. I remember one conversation that included people from uh, uh, EPA uh, that had come up from Denver for one of the Alberton citizens meetings that uh, suggested from, from my recollection that the inversion level was below a saddle that would have let material move from the Alberton area into the Nine Mile Valley. Uh, there were a number of, of uh, reports from people who lived in the Nine Mile Valley about feeling some effects from the incident, and so they were mentioning that uh, particular item uh, as an indication that it didn't look like the inversion lifted to the point where these materials could topographically spill down the other side. I do recall looking at maps uh, that were constructed showing some tree damage evidence of how far things moved. And I remember seeing the map including zones that went towards Missoula up, up river and turned the bend around the corner and what, to what would have led to the, the Nine Mile Battle. So that's, that's the extent of my recollection of the meteorological events. Was that tree damage prognosis? 
I, I didn't um, see the, the actual data that were used to make the map. I'm presuming that it was, it was some necrosis of the, the pine needles on some trees and chlorosis on others. Can you tell me, Dr. Uh, Smith, uh, who advised you that it was difficult to get a sample of the white dust? The, the, the practical difficulty of getting a sample? Um, during the, uh, the days that I was involved in that initial sampling, uh, we were actually using my laboratory over at the university to sort of stage things. Uh, so Chris Weiss was uh, working with me. Um, Dave Torgerson is a representative of Olympus Environmental, was the one who was actually coming in and, and getting the sampling material and then bringing the sample, uh, the, the samples back to me. So it was uh, Dave Torgerson from Olympus who said, we've looked for the white powder. We can't really scrape any up in, in an amount that, that we can bring in as a, a sample you can look at. Um, did you ever uh, suggest to the incident command that dioxin be tested for? I reported back uh, on the comments from uh, Dr. Demmel, the bleach uh, expert, and suggested that a, a sample from the tanker would be able to answer that question. I said that I couldn't do that analysis myself. The dioxin uh, samples are very complex analyses. When I've I've uh, been involved with that with the county. We send those to Research Triangle Park in North Carolina to get the analysis done. I can't do that in my own land. To the best of your knowledge, was that ever done? To the best of my knowledge, it was never done. Did you ever advise that contaminated soil be covered to prevent leaching to groundwater? Yes, I did. Uh, I did. Uh, made that suggestion as soon as I saw that there were uh, chlorinated cross products during the accident site. As I indicated, those have shown up in water samples associated with the pulp and paper industry. So those materials will dissolve into water, migrate uh, in water courses and in the groundwater. Since the site was fairly close to the Clark Fork River, I suggested that the areas that had uh, material uh, <coughs> from the Crestlet tanker be covered with plastic so that any rain might not uh, leach it further into the, the Beto zone. Was, to the best of your knowledge, was that ever done? I haven't uh, uh, looked at, at all the reports. My recollection is that that was done somewhat later, and it may not have ever been done completely. That's that's just pure trying to purely trying to recollect. I, I don't really have any direct knowledge of that. Mm -hmm. Did you feel at any time that the cloud or the plume may have contained other? Besides chlorine, I uh, assumed all along that the chlorine was the, the worst material that was around. Uh, I knew from comments that people made that other organic materials uh, were were being smelled by residents in the area. To be uh, uh, frank with you, when I help hear people talk about pesticide smell, I generally assume that they're talking about the solvent that's used in pesticide formulations, since many of the pesticides are, are solids uh, at room temperature, and, and they use that solvent as a, as a dispersing agent. So um, most of the pesticides are, are not volatile, so that they'll stick to their intended targets. Uh, and, and when people talk about odors, I'm, I'm figuring they're mostly talking about the solvents. Given what I know was there, uh, Definitely, Cresol has a very strong chemical odor. The mercaptans and thioethers and uh, thiols definitely have a very strong odor. So looking at the chemistry, I think those were the most likely candidates in my mind for reported odors from, from people. And I think that's what would be flying around preferentially uh, in, in a volatile or aerosol. <coughs> but you wouldn't rule out the possibility of like I wouldn't rule out the possibility. Thank you very much. You're welcome. I'd like to call at uh, this time Roger Shaw.
Chalmers is present. And also Lucinda Hodges.
in that process, I met Lucinda. I'd been in meetings with her, but her and I had never really known each other. She had the manifest of the train. I went, where did you get that? Nonetheless, she had the manifest of the train. I had the bills of lading, so we swapped. The manifest and the bills of lading don't completely match, which I thought was really strange. Um, it matches about 95%, but there's several cars there that are unaccounted for by bills of lading. So bills of lading is missing for derailed cars. It's my understanding the derailment happened between the fourth car behind power and the 21st car behind power. All those cars derailed. Well, I found reports when I finally for you EPA and I got what's called the START report. That's a Superfund Technical Assistance Response Team report. And I compared the bills of ladings and the manifest to that report. Again, there was mismatches. There was also cars listed in there as non-hazardous that I had the bills of ladings for that indeed were hazardous. And I thought, you know, there's something wrong here. Now, I agreed when I talked to this lady at the White House, Susan Smith, that if I found discrepancies that were serious, that I would start sending that back to the White House. I tried to submit chemical results and misinformation to my county. My county wouldn't accept it. House Department wouldn't accept it. The DA, DA District uh, Attorney uh, Deshaw called me personally and said, you don't want any of this crap, go away. You've got problems, tell your neighbors. So I called the, the state, and the state said, well, if the county won't accept it, we don't want it. So when I called the White House, I said, I think i got a problem out here. I got information that I think is pertinent to this spill and to the community and to the health and welfare of the people. And my county and my state won't accept it from me. I think that's wrong. And so they told me to start sending that stuff back to the White House. I did that. I did this investigation, worked on this investigation with these bills of ladings and college shippers and receivers, and asking for MSDSs for their products, asking if their products arrived or not. And I compiled all that information and I sent it back to the White House. The White House had quite a file. They finally asked me to contact the state ombudsman's office in Montana. I did. They were basically only concerned if you were in an old soldier's home and you had some little problem here. They didn't get into anything this magnitude. So I had to write back to the White House and tell them that. Well, their response back to me was they would contact the National EPA ombudsman's office and send this file to them and make a request from the White House <coughs> that they take on the Alberton case. Well, that happened, and then there was a time where Lucinda went to Kellogg to be involved in another spill and people up there. Mr. Martin had came to that meeting, met Lucinda, and I had written about Lucinda having the sickness of the people and the symptoms and what kind of medical attention we could get. She took the worst job, in my opinion, all the horror stories. I stayed on the investigation side. And we submitted this information back to the White House, which was in turn given to Mr. Martin. When Mr. Martin finally came here and met us, Lucinda had invited him down and he was coming down. Uh, he came to my home and we had quite a conversation about the file the White House had presented him. And we've gone through that file and there's so many discrepancies, incomplete things that don't match. Uh, there's, there's a document that the railroads uses called the CONSIST report, which is basically an in-house railroad document that tells their employees how to handle the train. I believe that that consensus report was handled to Mr. Waldron, emergency responders, and the rest of the federal people as a legitimate document, a legal document. It's not a legal document. It's an in-house document for their use. CFR Federal Regulations 49 outlines what is a legal document when you're talking about hazmat material. It's called the shipping paper in parentheses, bills of lading. The bills of ladings that I got from the White House are different than the CONSIST report. I want to know why. I want to know why the bills of ladings are different than the documentation the hazmat people were provided, what they used to do their work, what the EPA used to do its testing, what it used to write its reports. There's inconsistency. And this is the basis of why I believe we have the on investigation. There's inconsistency in federal reports and there shouldn't be. The testing has to be incomplete. The information's incomplete that's in that report. 
I have bills of ladings that I can submit. I have a start report I can submit that's outlined with the inconsistencies. Another issue that I, I found to my horror, we're dealing with a chemical spill in the Texas City, the people, is there was food on that train. That's right, food. Nestle's products, Delmonte products, things we all buy in the store. That food was poisoned. The public was never told there was food on the train. There was food going to Rwanda on the U.S. Department of Agriculture Feed the World program. One of those cars spilled, one of those did not. I, I'm very curious about the one that did not. Where did they go? Did they go to Rwanda and kill people? What happened? The one that did spill, there is a report, and it's, it states where some of the food went, some of the food that spilled, the Rwanda pea pill, peas that spilled the first time were made into chicken feed, and then sold to a commercial farm in Tacoma, Washington, which in turn poisoned that farm, and God knows how many people were ever. By the time they discovered that, I wonder what else they ground in the mill. Stagnant Feed and Grain Company in Lewiston, Idaho, was the place that the feed went back to. The peas went back to and were made into feed. Um, there's downline stories about incomplete handling of this hazmat train. There's been a lot of focus on the derailed cars, and very little focus on the rest of the train. On the manifest of the train, in the very first line, where it describes the engines, let me back up a little bit. When the train left Pasco, it has six engines, six engines because it comes uphill. When it gets to Sandpoint, they cut three out, and it comes downhill with three. Well, the lead engine on this train pulling food and toxic chemicals has what's called a defective EOT. EOT is end of train device. It refers to like the emergency brakes on a train. There's front of train brakes and there's back of train brakes. Well, this lead engine pulling this chemical train downhill had permanent defective emergency brakes, basically. I don't know if it had been as bad a pilot <coughs> if it had brakes working, but this is, this is the way this railroad's running its business. Wore out tracks, engines without brakes. We've had runaway trains here. It's been a nightmare for the people to live around this train after what happened to us. We've been constantly afraid of what else is going to happen. It's not if, it's just where and when. It's a, it's a twilight zone experience, let me tell you. Life is perfect one day, I'm not the next. I was personally buying a business, and it stopped my pursuit of buying a business. I had a federal loan to do that. So I hope that your federal investigation includes that area as well. Do you have any questions of me? On the first day of the uh, derailment incident, the morning of the incident, uh, is it true that you were physically overcome on your residential property from exposure to the plume and or the cloud from the derailment? Yes. Uh, that evening, because we had had rain for like eight days straight, we were all suffering, not just me, but the general neighborhood, uh, like flash flood. And we were out that evening uh, when the train wreck happened, digging a ditch to divert water from flooding the back of our house. Uh, the CNN helicopter, as I learned it was, came off the spill and came right over us. And shortly, about 20 minutes after that, we smelled something very strange. It wasn't like a pure chlorine smell, and it's, I, I thought I'd smell mahogany, and I was like, what the hell, in the middle of a rainy night. The fr my friend that was with me, we were both knocked out in the front yard. Um, we didn't even realize we'd been knocked out. We just found, I found myself on the ground. He had just come out of the military. He was 24, very stout. He, he passed, up the, passed out on his feet, tripod with a shovel. Um, that morning, when we still didn't know what had happened. Uh, it was about 9 o'clock that we had realized something was really seriously wrong. Uh, we could see what looked like a cloud eking over the, the divide between Nine, Nine Mile and, and uh, Alberton. And you could, uh, there was a strange smell in the air. We, we couldn't get it. It wasn't anything that I ever smelled in the seven or eight years I lived in that valley. So you both blacked out? Yes. And how long were you blacked out? We figured we missed about 40, 45 minutes of time. And what did you do when you came to? I was trying like hell to figure out what I was doing on the ground. Uh, 
and I didn't know how long I had been there. I mean, uh, the, there was no recollection of time. The neurologically shut us off. I took about two steps towards my house, and I turned myself back on the ground again. And I was going, deja vu, you know, what's going on here? I have a heart condition. Uh, I say, well, veteran, so I thought, well, perhaps I worked too hard and pushed it. I was trying to rationalize in my mind what's going on. I didn't know my friend that was with me was knocked down. Uh, we didn't know that of each other at the same time because we weren't in the proximity of seeing each other. When we came back into the house and we looked at the clock and we went, geez, can't be that late. I mean, we were working in 20 minute stenches because it was so wet and cold coming in and drinking coffee and drying off. Well, the last stench was like 40, 45 minutes. And we were like, where'd the time go? You know, we didn't know exactly at that moment what had happened. I found myself on the ground. I didn't even ask him if he had any problems until later that afternoon when we realized what we had been through. I said, did anything strange happen to you? And he said, yeah, he blinked his eyes. And then after blinking his eyes, the ditch that we were digging was running over and the house was being flooded. And it wasn't before he blinked his eyes, which we looked at that as being about 20 put them in extensions and we were out there about 45, 45 minutes. Mm -hmm. And during that time there was a complete lapse of had no memory? Idea. Nothing. It was just as though that time had never passed. Did you subsequently re-enter your home? Well, yes, from that we were outside and we went right in the house and dried off and dried coffee. Uh, I sent the rest of them to bed. I, I had my heart felt like it was going to come through my chest and it was going nine miles an hour. I got real dizzy. There was like an orange wash in my eyes, kind of an orange wash like look. I mean, uh, when I walked in the house, when I got in the house on the door, I looked up at the light, um, everything turned orange. And I almost passed out again, and I, I didn't. But I was like, wow, what the hell's going on? You know, I, mean, I couldn't explain it. Did you call 911? I called 911 about, oh, somewhere between 9 and 10 in the morning, and explained who I was and that uh, I thought we were having a problem. And the lady cut me off. She said, Mr. Chalmers, you're in a safe zone. Stay put and shut out the phone. And uh, I walked around outside for about 10 minutes, pissed off. Well, what the hell is this? And that's when I went back in and called the EPA, unfortunately, DC, and said, this has to be removed from the device. Did you also call the White House after you called 911? No, I didn't call the White House until about the eighth month after the storm. But you did call EPA? I called EPA, Washington, DC. And what did they advise you? Well, they put me through a 45-minute questionnaire. Uh, about half, little, about three quarters of the way through that, they stopped me and said, "We feel that you're in a hazardous zone. You should be evacuated, but we don't have the authority to evacuate you from here." And I said, "Well, how about making a hell of a referral?" You know, um, they also said that they would be dispatching uh, Chris Weiss and Steve Way from Region 8. <coughs> they wanted to know if I could meet them in the next morning. And I said, "Well." At the two o'clock red line meeting, this is the only thing I know that they're scheduled. Were you nonetheless advised to leave? Yes. About 3.30, Linda Frost uh, called back and said that there was two rooms for us at the day's end, and we were considering ourselves evacuated. Wanted to know if we could get out of our own, and we did. Questions? Thank you. Thank you. Send them. Can everybody hear me in the back? I was having a little a hard time. My name's Lucinda Hodges. At the time of the, the chemical spill, I lived in Alberton, Montana. I'd like to give testimony today as a mother whose family was poisoned and dislocated by the chemical spill, and as one of the founders of the Alberton Community Coalition for Environmental Health. We're a grassroots group that formed after the spill whose mission is to improve the quality of life for the victims of this chemical spill. I would call this a massive spill with 133 tons of chemicals dumped about a mile or so from my home. One of the most important reasons from my perspective that we're here today, more than four years after the derailment, is to tell Montana Rail Link and the EPA and ATSTR and the Missoula County Health Department that the long-term chronic health problems that they said would not happen have happened 
to many of the evacuees. My family is very ill, and we were misled and lied to in 1996 about the possible long-term health effects from our acute chemical exposure. No one from the railroad or the agencies prepared us for the health problems that were to come and that my family now faces. I would like to show you the prescription medicines that we take every day. I'll begin with my son, Jesse. He was six years old when the spill happened and in perfect health. I brought his med box. It's this pink box right here, and Jesse can't travel without that box. He, if he leaves the house for any extended period of time, he has to have the box with him. Contained in the box are his current medications at this time, which he takes twice a day. Flovent, Cerevent, which are both inhalers, Cinerex and Nasonex, he uses an albuterol inhaler as needed, which he carries with him at all times. And this nebulizer, which is a machine to help open up his lungs if the albuterol inhaler doesn't work. And he uses this with albuterol as needed. Some months he uses this machine as much as 10, 12 times a month. Jesse suffers from chronic and nearly constant headaches, bacterial infections, sinus problems, joint and muscle pain, fatigue, and stomach upset. He doesn't play sports and he's homeschooled. His lung capacity is severely restricted and his life has been completely and irrevocably altered forever because of this derailment in Montana Rail Link. His brother Trask, who was nine years old at the time of the spill, this is his bag of medications that he's currently taking. Inside is albuterol and a nasal steroid. One is nasocort and the other one is rhinocort. <coughs> Trost's eyes were chemically burned and his vision impaired in 1996. I take the following medications at this time here in this bag. Claritin, guaifenesin, and Singular. My eyes were chemically burned and my vision impaired my brain damaged from the chemicals MRL exposed me to while I was in my home. I'd also like to add to this, and I brought it with me in the med box, and I'd like to put it on the record, are some of the, ex the bills related to these drugs. Some of these inhalers are $100 a piece. My family is totally financially responsible for these drugs. Montana Relic does not pay any medical expenses or any expenses for my family, and it's been almost five years. None of us used any medications at the time of the spill. Which brings me to my next point I'd like to make today, and I think another reason that we're here is to speak about accountability. Who's accountable to the people in Alberton, to the evacuees, to the injured victims? Who pays? At this time, for my family, it's not Montana Relic. My family is paying for what they did. We pay the price emotionally, physically, financially. All of it is, is all, all burdens for this bill have been placed on my family. Um, that's as far as I got with my prepared testimony, so from here I'd like to enter some things on the record that illustrate, I think, one of the other reasons that we're here about accountability that has to do with the EPA. I have a picture here of Mr. John Smith. He's deceased. He was killed during the spill from chlorine inhalation. This picture was on the record in Region 8 Denver EPA, and when I made a recent trip to Denver, I got it from them. He was left out there for three days before he was found, and he was found by the EPA. But it's unfortunate that they didn't go out there till that day. They were not on site, as earlier testimony, I believe, has indicated, for three or four days. I don't have the, the actual date in front of me. But I think people forget about Mr. Smith and the fact that someone was killed here. And I'd like to put this picture on the record along with other things. 
and our group, ACCEH, has quite a bit of written material we'll be submitting while the, the record is open, but I don't have it all here today. Noting at this juncture, the bills will be included as Exhibit C for purposes of the record. The photo will be included as Exhibit D, and also the note that that is from the administrative record of the Environmental Protection Agency in Denver, Colorado. That's correct. And also a clarification at this juncture, it is your testimony that the Environmental Protection Agency was not working in the hot zone during what period of time? The initial days. I believe the 14th is the day the first one person at a time. Yeah, it's my understanding they were not there during the initial days. What, and what do you mean in particular by the initial days? How many days? Three to four days. Three to four days. That's correct. Mr. Palmer, do you have anything to add to that? Uh, the 14th. See? The 14th was the day that the EPA arrived and was allowed on the scene itself. Uh, it's in the first paragraph of the start report, um, identifies it right there. Uh, one other point that, that Lucinda brought up that I wanted to make was that we had acute chemical diagnosis, acute chemical exposure diagnosis is from my home, from everybody that was there. And, uh, Lucinda's wonderful work in the area of finding what medical treatment we can get deserves a lot of attention, and she hasn't spoken that area. That's something that the railroad left us to figure out. Uh, we didn't have medical people approach us during any of these red lion uh, meetings that were taking place. They had a veterinarian speak to the group. No medical doctors. I just want to be clear. So your testimony as well that the EPA was not working in the hot zone of the derailment site during at least the first three to four days of the incident. That's correct. That is my testimony. And your testimony is supported by uh, references made in the start report, which is an official EPA document. Absolutely. Right from Region 8. Thank you. Please proceed. Ms. I'd like to also add that this is information that just came out in hindsight. At the time that we were evacuated and it happened, we knew the EPA had been called to respond. I think the citizens were misled because we felt that they were in control as any as you would expect with any federal response. We did not realize at the time that they were taking a, uh, a lesser role than I think that their mandate allows. It would be my understanding that their mandate means that they should be out there on the scene. They certainly have trained people protecting the public. I don't think that should have been left to Montana Rail Lane to decide. They were the polluter. And I think a lot of the problems that my group has with the response has to do with that, that Montana Rail Lane seemed to have a lead position and not the EPA. And why is it you believe EPA was not in a lead position during the derailment incident and the follow up? Well, to begin with, they were not included in the daily evacuation meetings initially on the Unified Command. The EPA people were in the audience with us, and they might have occasionally answered a question, but they were not on the panel. So, and to the best of your recollection, your observance was that they were in the audience with you when briefings occurred relating to the incident. That's correct, and, and one of the anecdotal things that happened at the time of course, the EPA stayed in the same hotels we were, and it was our information that Chris Weiss had removed his family from the Missoula area, and that alarmed quite a few of us. We had felt we'd come to someplace safe, and if the EPA personnel didn't think it was safe for their families, that, that raised a lot of questions for us. Mr. Chalmers, do you have anything to add? Uh, yes, uh, I spoke with Chris Weiss that morning when he first arrived, identified myself, and he was aware of my call to the EPA. Uh, it's like Lucinda said, I believe for the first four days, Chris Weiss was in the audience with all of us, and uh, once in a while solicited a question, and I went to him and I said, how come you're on that board in here? And he said, well, you know, I don't totally agree with him right now. And then about the fifth day, he was up there, and he stayed there from then on. But indeed, the EPA was in town and held out. We were kept from the, the site. 
So it's your it's your testimony and to the best of your recollection that in conversations with Dr. Weiss from Region A of the EPA, they were not involved initially in response to the incident directly? That's, that's correct. They were not involved in any of the criteria as to what to approach, what to do, that Mr. Walden spoke of early on. Just to note for the record, uh, Dr. Weiss and Mr. Way are, are not present uh, in this hearing, but uh, we will be in touch with them to confirm uh, or not confirm this testimony. Please proceed, Ms. Thomas. Well, speaking for myself, I wish that they would have attended or been able to attend today, and as well, the Missoula City County Health Department, the Department of Environmental Quality. We certainly have waited a long time to be able to have a public forum with them. And that is another, one of the reasons we petitioned your presence at this site is because this is the first formal public meeting we've had since we were evacuated. And that seems like an awfully long time to gain any accountability <coughs> on the record. I think what I'd like to address next are some of the, uh, I made a few notes while Dr. Darren Smith was. Before you proceed, Ms. Hodges, I'd like to recognize at this time that uh, Ms. Crowley is here from the Missoula City Council. I'd just like to thank her for being present. Ms. Hodges, please proceed. Okay. Um, Dr. Smith talked about pesticide smells, and that's been a big uh, complaint from the citizens from the time that we were first allowed any kind of re-entry, which would have been about the third or fourth day. Again, I feel if the EPA had gained access to the site immediately, then perhaps the other chemicals that had been spilled would have been recognized and those re-entries might not have been made. We'll never know. But based on what we knew at the time, we were only being told chlorine was on the ground or being spilled into the atmosphere. So when people made re-entry, at the third and fourth day to get belongings, they had no idea that there was potassium chrysalid and other substances possibly at the site that could have migrated. And I think that, that they should have been fully informed before they were allowed to make that decision. And it's at that time that the citizens learned about the pesticide smell. As our friends and neighbors came back, they complained of feeling ill and headaches and not being able to think correctly and that the area smelled like pesticides. And I think as a housewife and a Montana and you use your common sense, that smell was smelled as far away as our lead, which is 30, 35 air miles from the derailment site. And to me, if you can smell it, you're being exposed to it. And that is the basis of a lot of the questions that my group has raised about the pesticide smells. I'd also like to, to clarify that at the time there were very dis there were two other distinct odors. There was a very sweet chemical odor that people complained of, as well as the pesticide smell and the chlorine smell. And I'm making a point of that so that the experts in the room hopefully can use that information and tell us what it was we were exposed to. That's the basis of what people still don't know now, four and a half years later. And I have letters that our group wrote just months after the spill, and those same questions we wrote to Mr. Weiss and Steve Way at Region A EPA, we feel have never been answered. They were very simple, straightforward questions. Why are we sick? Why are we experiencing symptoms that we were never told would, would come? I think that most of us have been horrified that we were told there were only short-term problems and that we would be fine in a matter of days or weeks. And to, to watch your family over the years become sicker with every passing month and not have these answers is the reason we're here today. So the pesticide smell is one issue of Smith's I'd like to Can I ask speak you to the record, who told you that the problems would only be short term in nature? The Unified Command, which was Ellen Leahy and Dan Watts of Montana Rally, um, Scotty Waldron was up there. I uh, can't specifically remember any other names at this point. Before the EPA got But it was the Unified Command. We looked to them for the answers. And they were very clear that we were exposed to low levels of quality and should experience only short-term problems. 
the other chemicals were not made an issue of, and everyone who went to those evacuation meetings clearly remembers uh, Ms. Leahy using the analogy that leaning over your washing machine and putting a cup of bleach in to whiten your clothes was about the type of exposure we had just experienced. And I now know that that is completely inaccurate because of documents that we have obtained through FOIA from Region 8 EPA because there was plume modeling that was available before we were even in our hotels. Modeling that showed we were possibly exposed to hundreds of parts per million, near-death fatal levels of chlorine, theoretically, from their modeling. That was never shared with us while we were evacuated. And I personally asked Ellen Leahy and Unified Command for that information. We were told it was not possible, and I now know that I was lied to about that. I think I had a right to know that. Just, just after the incident and during the evacuation period, did the EPA ever tell you that the problems were short-term in nature? I don't know that I spoke again to anyone from the EPA um, after the evacuation. Is that what your question was? They left. They weren't there. Tom? Yes. The EPA did avoid those questions. Uh, it's like she said, they did vacate the area. I was left from by Dave Torgerson a uh, lab result from the matrix down in my home uh, by the EPA. And uh, he handed it to us and ran away. I mean, literally ran across the parking lot and left, and we were sitting here with this report in our hand going, what the hell is this? We couldn't read it, and they wouldn't, they wouldn't tell us what it meant. They just literally left, as she said. Um, some of the documents that we did request, I, I FOIA'd what's called the tentative identified compounds. Uh, I communicated with Paragon Laboratories, that's the one the EPA used for their splits. It took me a year to do that. It was a Deborah Pender, I believe was the uh, lab director, and she sent me this package that identifies the tentatively identified compounds. They briefed that as ticks. Uh, in going over this package, we were looking at chain of custody documents, and there's some question as to the way sampling was handled, uh, whether some of the sampling had what's called headroom in it, uh, which allows the uh, chemical contents to stay in there and basically not evaporate. Uh, and I think that some of this original chain of custody waste sampling was done by the EPA, and probably the Olympus site as well. It's just a subject to uh, sloppy work. I think that that's subject to review, and we'll probably see that a lot of the chemical results in the start report are not useful for that reason. And I have that to submit as well. Is it your testimony then that the chain of custody problems you're speaking of were identified on the face of the laboratory documents themselves? Yes, yes. Uh, it talks about some of the samples not arriving to the lab intact. Some of the uh, samples actually broke open. There was some question about headroom. I didn't understand headroom until there was some discussion about it. Um, the samples have to be taken and sealed. And I believe they're supposed to be kept refrigerated. And there's a whole event of protocol for the way it's handled. And in the front document, the way it's filled out, there's a there's real question about it. So it would be your conclusion, based upon a review of the lab documents themselves, that there were patent problems with the chain of custody involving holding times, compromised samples. Absolutely, yes. And in your view, would that cast a significant doubt upon the efficacy of those samples? Absolutely, yes. It would eliminate any of the VOC quality being found. In other words, for a lot of us who don't understand that, there would be no toxicity left in the sample. Would you like to submit the lab documentation for the purposes of this record? Yes. So admit it. And I also uh, have a copy of the start report that I've annotated with the corrections in it uh, from some of these reviews for the sake of people to understand it. And I'll submit that as well for the record. So admitted. Stop it. The other point I'd like to make is, and it goes back to Dr. Garen Smith's testimony, and I think a contention between Region 8 EPA and the community group ACCH 
is the migration of what left. And that's, I see that as the root of why we're here today as well. And I go back to what I said before, that I think it goes to common sense that if you can smell something, it's moved, it's there. And to my knowledge, monitoring of chlorine does not tell you if pesticides are in the air. And as you look back on the public record, there are volumes and volumes of bi chlorine monitoring. And I don't know what value that has to us when you're wanting to know what is the pesticide smell. It was good information for the chlorine, but it was not relevant for the pesticide smell. And I do not understand why, that, why there was not organic air monitoring. I'd also like to add that I've publicly and privately and legally complained about my home, my inability to live in it because of the contamination, the odors in my home, the fact that I get sick in my home, and I've been dislocated for nearly five years now. And in all that time, Montana Rail Link has never once offered to test or monitor or enter my home or observe in any way any of the problems. And neither has Region 8 EPA. I've made formal, written, and verbal requests in every way possible. And I don't feel any effort has been made to document what the experience of my family has been, and I know from my work as director of ACCH and many other people who just have simply given up and abandoned their homes and left. And with that, I'd like to enter into the record. For a former Alberton resident, this copy of the Missoula Independent. This is Kimberly Garst, and she lived in Alberton at the time of the spill, and she was unable to come. And this is an article about homeless people. This is what happened to Ms. Garst. At the time of the spill, she was a hard-working union woman, single mother, had a beautiful home that she was extremely proud of, and, had a, and she was extremely proud to be a, a woman union worker in Montana. She became very ill after the spill, too ill to work, and that created a, an onset of many problems for her and her family. She lost her job, her health insurance, her home, her children, her dignity. And I wanted to be sure that she was represented here today, even though she could not attend herself. So admitted. Um, Ms. Hodge has a question before we proceed to go further. Uh, to the best of your knowledge, and, and based upon the direct experience uh, during and after the spill, um, were there any other chemicals discussed before in the ambient air that you were aware of besides chlorine? I am aware through some notes in the public record that there was organic air monitoring. Uh, some of those notes are with the Missoula County Health Department, uh, Ellen Leahy, and I wish she were here to discuss those notes today. Her notes reflect that they were detecting, um, I believe it was some types of trichlorinated phenols in the air, um, in the tr I think by the tracks it says. So we do know that there was some testing, but a full accounting of that has not been made to my knowledge and to the people. So you personally observed those notes? Yes, I have. Okay. Mr. Chong, do you have anything to add on that issue? Um, there's a lot of documents that we've requested that have not come to this day from Region 8. Uh, we went right to the records section, and we have yet to receive those documents. Uh, so what you're talking about is what we managed to glean from Lucinda's wonderful work with a few other ladies going around and picking up documents, and then later sitting down and analyzing them and putting them in order. Uh, there are some questions about peripheral comments from the command post, what we call the command post manifest, uh, in that area. And it would be very, very helpful if those command post people would have been here. Thank you. Ms. Hodges, please proceed. Um, I think the next item I'll, I'll bring up and then maybe if you have further questions is just um, our group has worked very hard because nobody else was there to do the work. Uh, Region 8 EPA, as we said, left 
and despite all the complaints, never came back and evidently couldn't make it today even to discuss the problems. So the people were left with the burden of figuring this out for ourselves, which is why the group formed to begin with, why it's persisted, because we have not been able to get an adequate government response. Um, ATSDR isn't here today. People are very familiar with their health studies and their work in the community. And we have criticized them uh, for, for many reasons, but I would, I would just today like to make the point that the only reason that they even did respond was after months and months and months, turning into years of citizens persisting and complaining. And to this day, we don't understand the lack of concern by our own government. This was, after all, the second largest chlorine spill in railroad history, the first largest mixed chemical spill. This was a huge event. And the fact that it's taken almost five years to have even a public hearing is amazing to me. The total, uh, the apathy, and the, the disregard for the public health in Alberton and the people. And I think part of that, I would like to speak a little bit to social and environmental justice issues because Alberton is a very rural, sparsely populated part of America and Montana. And very few people were impacted for what was a huge evacuation zone. I've seen in the records there were 77 square miles. They only had to evacuate about 1,200 people. That shows how, if this had occurred anywhere else, the, the devastation would have been much greater. And I think because of the fact that we're rural and poor, we have been ignored. And everybody counts, everybody counts in America, and I don't think we should be ignored because we don't have deep pockets or nice homes or pretty paved streets. Yes, everybody does count. Um, Thanks for coming. Um, before you proceed further in your testimony, um, to the best of your knowledge, and I'll ask Mr. Chalmers as well, how were the derailed cars managed after the incident? You know, I don't, I, of course I wasn't out there. I don't have any first-hand knowledge. All I can speak to is what we've seen in the public record. And I'll say again, we went to the public record to find our answers because it was the only way we knew to get the answers. And what did the public record speak of? What I see in the public record, first of all, is that the potassium cresslet that spilled, that the notations about caustic cars and, and sodium hydroxide or sodium chlorate, that even the notes are hard to follow. And the information was so sloppily put into the record that it's truly hard to know what was going on. So you wonder how confusing it was for them at the time. There was evidently a lot of confusion over what product it was and what it could do. And again, the EPA does not even mention it in their records until the fourth day. So I assume they had no knowledge of it. And that troubles me a great deal. They should have known. The railroad knew it was on the ground. To the best of your knowledge, were any of the rail cars buried near the site or on the site of the derailment? Yes, there has been testimony and given to me by community residents. And we have a videotape a hand by uh, by a local citizen, um, it's very difficult because he has tremors, uh, but it does show cars being broken down and evidently buried at the site. Mr. Thomas, do you have anything to add on that? Yes, I do. I opened up the start report to the page that lists the non-hazardous cars and the hazardous cars. And this is what's going through the record was submitted. There were cars buried, there were three cars buried. There's a story behind all three cars that uh, seems interesting to me in my investigations. Two of the cars that are buried are listed in the start report as non-hazardous. One of those cars there's a bill of ladings missing for. One of those I have the bill of ladings for and it's a placard line product in direct conflict with the way it's represented right here. There's an extra french fry car listed here that does not belong in the derail list, did not derail. There was three French fry cars. This is the last French fry car that derailed. 
from Nestle's. There's a Rwanda P card missing from this report that derailed. That's the P card that they made chicken feed out of and poisoned products of people. I find it highly suspicious that this start report is that inaccurate. These are not typos. There are very railroad cars, and I find it serious. I asked uh, BFI and people to take salvage why they weren't getting these cars anymore. Why weren't you taking these cars? Because it seemed to me like uh, it would be good money to salvage that metal. And their comment to me was that even handling empty railroad cars with nothing in them made their people sick. And they refused to take any more scrap. So it's my assumption, my opinion, they buried these cars. But these three cars that are buried have very unique stories behind them. I have to ask you, were you told this by BFI specifically regarding these cars? Not these three cars, but cars from the railroad site in general. <coughs> I believe that uh, in the movie that I saw, they removed the ends of the cars, which must have what's called the VIN number or the identification number on them. And they trucked those to some different location. They didn't bury those. Uh, in the Federal Railroad report that I got concerning one of these cars, uh, there's a letter from Rocky Rail Services to, I believe it's Dan Watts, that says this car was uh, sliced and diced and sent to some company. And that's a direct conflict with them video showing the cars buried. I, I was surmised that they took the ends of the cars off so that nobody could dig that up and, and tell what kind of car, what car that was. I, I absolutely identified it. Um, that also played into when the protocol was developed for this new testing round, I was asked by Dr. Goldner and uh, a few others from that Sage Environmental, would those cars interfere with their probes going into the site? And my answer was, well, I suppose it would. You know, use a metal probe to see if there's something on the go. But I mean, very railroad cars next to the river that had chemicals in them, I think, is a serious issue. Thank you. Please proceed. Another issue that's been a conflict between the community and Region 8 is the on site fire. And they have denied that that happened. And today, we will have evidence that we're going to be putting in the record. I don't know if someone could get it for me right now, actually. Um, there, the, the woman could not be here, but we have a written statement from her. She was an eyewitness to the fire. We have other people who have personally testified to me that they saw a fire on site. I also understand there are photographs of the fire and we were unfortunately not able to bring those with us today, but we hope that the ombudsman will be able to obtain them. The person who has them didn't feel, uh, he, he didn't want to bring them down here today, but they are available. And the reason that the fire is such an issue between the community or my group and EPA, because it, it, it goes directly to the question of the dioxins and the testing. The EPA has repeated verbally and in letters from the very beginning that there was no need to test for dioxins because there was no heat. And I believe a fire would be considered heat. And the, they've disputed the fire, and, and we feel we can show that there is, there is reason to test for dioxins. There was reason four and a half years ago. And we would like to make sure that that is looked into by your office. I'll read the short paragraph that says right in the start report that's it's labeled rationale for not conducting dioxin sampling. Oh, can you tell me this is the start report? Yes, this is the can start. Can you tell me what page you're reading from? Uh, it's it's 4.0 uh, in its paragraph number <coughs> one. It says the reaction which occurred between liquid vapor and gas phase of chlorine during the initial leakage of tank car number three. ACFX85824 and the potassium crystallate car is not likely to have produced sufficient heat for formation of dioxins. This is what they put in the report. Thank you. I think the dioxins has been an ongoing issue, obviously, because of how poisonous dioxins are. They're persistent in the environment and even a layperson, housewife, 
can understand that you would want to know if they're there for one and that they would explain some of the symptoms people have had and many people have been treated as if they have mental health problems rather than physical problems because they aren't explained by a chlorine exposure. And I'd like to talk about that a little bit, the fact that this has been characterized as a chlorine spill by Montana Relink, by EPA, ATSDR, and the Missoula County Health Department. And in, in fact, there was more potassium crescent spilled on the ground than chlorine. The crescent was the larger of the two chemicals spilled. And we've hotly contested the characterization. We feel if the spill had been characterized as a mixed chemical spill, that people's health issues would have been addressed more rapidly and would have prevented a lot of the very serious health problems that people are enduring right now. Um, do you have any questions? Or? Does that complete your initial testimony? I think so. Are there any other documents you wish included for the record as exhibits? Uh, not at this time. We'll, like I said, our group would like to reserve to place those on the record as we gather them up in the next uh, few weeks. I, I did have a, a note here that the, the audience is asking if this is a good time to share video of the agency people who have not come. I believe we have tape ready of Ellen Leahy and Tom Elhoff. Well, before we proceed with the video, are there any questions from Representative Bookout? No. Senator Elliott? And uh, actually, before we proceed with the video, I, I just want to confirm, uh, is there any representative from Montana Rail Link in the room? I'm Montana Rail Link's lawyer. I wrote you a letter. If you have it, I'd like to be part of the record. Okay. And you are, sir? My name is Randy Cox. For the record. And you are counsel to MRM? Yes, sir. Okay. And you, um, you should feel free uh, during the course of the proceeding today um, to testify if you wish. If you I don't can. think it's appropriate for counsel to testify, but I appreciate the invitation. What I would like is to have the opportunity afterwards to submit materials if that's appropriate from the ombudsman standpoint and if we deem it appropriate in light of various things that have been said. But the fact is, we're in litigation with most of these people. We prefer to keep all of our issues with respect to responsibility and damages within the confines of the litigation, not within the confines of an uncontrolled hearing. Thank you. Your submissions will be entirely appropriate after the hearing. And um, I assume uh, you stand by the communication which you forwarded to me about 48 hours ago on jurisdiction and the nature of the hearing. Is that correct? It's in the record. It's in the record. And the letter will be included for the record. Thank you. And um, before we proceed with the visual presentation, I'd like to take a five minute recess and we'll resume. Thank you.